yeah so i think we're we're live hopefully anyway and um, if not there'll be four minutes cut out of uh, content <laughs> but uh, we're back here with the SEO crew mastery with robert weatherhead how are we robert i'm very good thank you how are you yeah not too bad not too bad for those who don't know robert is a top top level seo and um, would you call yourself sort of a seo consultant or independent seo or freelancer or what's sort of the title yeah, consultant of or freelancer. I mean, uh, there's there's um, there's not too too much between between them. It just depends how someone wants to utilize your skills. Really, some people want that more consultancy advisory role. Some people want you to take control of things for them. And I guess that's the only way of differentiating. But yeah, I'm happy to do either. Excellent, excellent. And we know you have experience working with sort of large multinational companies as well as sort of smaller SMEs. But mm. um, just for so people get a bit of a background on you, how did you sort of get into SEO in the first place? What was what sort of attracted you to the industry? Um, I, I guess like most people, by accident to a certain degree, I came came out of uni in, in 2004, um, ended up getting a job running paid search campaigns for, uh, for an agency in Warrington at the time. Uh, didn't really know what, search was search marketing was what paid search was anything like that but 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 came out with a marketing degree um and an interest in the internet as it was then or e-marketing as people like to call it back in 2004 and um uh and and found a job in it and it just kind of went from there really that that agency became what was then known as latitude which has since been bought by jellyfish and, and was at the time one of the biggest search marketing agencies in the country um and, and search marketing at that point was dominated by by paid. There wasn't too much going on in the in the world of SEO. Um, but as the agency grew and grew, it obviously expanded into that area. And and I guess that was my first foray into it, um, working with clients in SEO. Um, and then, kind of as I've gone through my agency career, uh, search marketing's always been part of what what I've been doing and then so when I when I kind of came out to do my own thing it was uh logical to move back in that direction really I think excellent excellent and was there a sort of set amount of time or how long did it take before you sort of realized that you know you want to go into into the freelancing side of things um it was so I did about 15 years in agencies so I did a a good old stint Um, yeah I was gonna say it, it wasn't. It wasn't like I. Uh, I disliked it at all. I, I think. I think I reached a point with, with that that um, that world where I'd kind of done a lot. I've done, you know, growing agencies, fast growth agencies. I've done small independent agencies. I've done two of the biggest agencies. Um, well, part of the biggest networks in the world, but biggest agencies in in my part of the world in Manchester. Um, and it kind of felt there was not much more to do there. I never really had the ambition to set up my own agency. So mm-hmm. kind of that was that was off the table. So it just kind of felt natural. Um, and I, and I, re- I guess I reached a point where in my life, I guess, where I felt like I wanted to have a little bit more control over, over myself and my destiny to a certain degree, yeah. um, as opposed to being in you know, a career and a job where you you kind of, you you know, it's defined for you. There's a route forward. There's a, you know, there's a ladder there to try and climb. Um, So, yeah. And then actually uh, there was a, by weird circumstance, kind of, as I was reaching that point of making that, having that thought process about taking control of my own destiny, I was actually made redundant. So it kind of then threw me into this scenario where there was no more, I guess there was no more excuses. There was no more delay tactics. It was like, well, we might as well do it now then. Yeah. Um, that's I what I did. Mm. Um, in your 15 years of uh, experience, if I can call it that way, between freelancing and consulting, um, what are some of the bigger uh, bottlenecks that you experienced um, with your clients? Um, I think especially um, more so after the pandemic, if I can mm. put it that way. Um, what are some of the bigger experiences currently that... Uh, uh, your clients are struggling with the common themes um i mean bottle bottlenecks are really different or, or, or um the, the the issues are really different depending on the size of the business mm. so you work with a small business and their their issue is um resource a lot of the time you know they've not got resource to get things done they're running the business they're they're marketing sales um managing the stock doing you know doing all these other things at, yeah. at the same time they, they've not got time to be learning about seo or any other anything else for that matter and, and then to be 
um, I guess, making changes to a website or doing anything else that, that, that it, writing content, whatever it might be. They've not got the time for that. Um, mm. So with those guys, time is the challenge and that's, that, that's their bottleneck. And I think if you, if you, if you're a freelancer, that's what you, that's what you become. You come, you become an extension of their team and you become that person who does the things for them. Mm. Um, the other end of the spectrum at the, um, you know, enterprise level, international level, whatever, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> The, the, mm. the challenges there are more around um, stakeholder management sometimes, getting stakeholder buy-in. Um, you still have very big businesses who don't believe in SEO, who don't believe in some of these things, and it's going to make a difference to their business. So you, you spend a lot more time convincing people to do something mm. than the actual doing itself. Or yeah. the, mm. the other side of the bottleneck that you get there is with um, kind of development teams, development queues, um, you know, where... You can be proposing changes, putting in, creating tickets for changes, asking them to do certain things, um, and it's so far down their priority list that it either, ne- either you know, part of it gets done or it never gets done, and you you you, you spend your time kind of fighting those political battles to get things done. That those really are the two differences between smaller and um, smaller and enterprise businesses, I would say. Um, but then you know, there's challenges. There's challenges, kind of all the time that arise with changes with how search engines are, you know, uh, viewing websites, how they're ranking websites, how platforms evolve, you know, a particular CMS mm. will make changes which breaks things or which creates opportunities sometimes. And so there's always there's always things change there and the, the challenges are different from one client to the next. That's, I mean, that's the that's the exciting part, really. If it was yeah. Yeah. Time, it'd, be, it'd be boring doing the same thing over and over again. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> And just to expand on that, uh, do you have like a preference between working with SMEs or them enterprise clients? Which one to work with or within? I, I like to have strategy? a balance because of because I guess because of how I've I've just um, described it. There, it's like if you if you work in enterprise all the time, um, you spend your life talking, communicating, convincing all these other things, um, and actually the the strategizing and the or even elements of the doing are a very small part of your um of the role um and so mm-hmm. you, you kind of you have to become a very good communicator you have to become a very good politician you have to mm-hmm. build bonds build relationships and mm-hmm. you know you don't always want to be doing that um whereas you know it's, it's with with smes as much as you don't you kind of bypass a lot of that and you can get things done it, they, they come with their own challenges as well you know a lot of the a lot of the smes um Strong-minded individuals. Um, some of them think they know what's best. Don't want to kind of always defer to defer to an expert. They want oh, I've, I've just come across this blog post yeah. from 2006 that tells me I should be doing this. You know, should we not be doing that? And you, so, you, so you can kind of have those challenges as well. Yeah. Um, so I, I think a mix is always best um, wherever possible. Definitely. And uh, when you're taking on new clients, do you have like a vetting process you would go through in order to take on the client or how would you tackle that situation? I don't think it's a process. I think um, I think you get a feel for it over time as to whether someone's going to be someone you want to work with or not. Yeah. A lot of that you get very quickly within those early um those early conversations. There's there's red flags that you, you, you tend to pick up along the way. Um, you know, someone who says, Oh, I just need someone to do this is is quite a red flag. It's like they if if they're already deciding what they want doing <laughs> They're not mm-hmm. really going to listen to you if you tell them it's the wrong thing or you tell them that more needs to be done. Um, or if someone's going, um, can you do this for this amount of money? That's typically a red flag as well in that they've decided that something costs a certain amount of money yeah. and they're probably not going to be open to the conversation if it doesn't. Depends what the amount is, obviously. If it's yeah, a large yeah. money, then maybe it can be. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's, there's certain red flags and... and um, once you've spoken to someone, you tend to get you, you tend to get a feeling for for whether they're going to be someone you can kind of work well with. I don't I don't think there's I don't think there's a, there's not a list of things I would say. I check this 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 yeah. this and this. It's yeah. more you speak to someone for a while and you get a feeling with. Am I going to be able to work with this person? And 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 it's other things like you, you know, for most people, if someone approaches me and says, "Can you help me with?" You know, my website, my business, whatever it might be. Mm. I always go back with a, a list of questions to begin with. You know, I'm, I'm going to gather mm-hmm. some information. To tell if they're not forthcoming with that information, 
Yeah. It's not a great sign that they're committed to getting something done. It's not a great sign that they're going to yeah. give you something back. It's actually a sign that we want you to just take our problem away and do something with it, and we don't want to be involved in it, which is mm-hmm. it's never a good Another red flag. Yeah, it's yeah. all these little things yeah. that you just pick up on through communication. Yeah, you pick up. Just like, yeah. 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 In, in terms of, like, I know you've obviously worked across a lot of sort of niches or, or verticals, but is there one that you say tend to sort of target the most because i know it, it probably changes a lot like i gaming and say like sort of SaaS tools and stuff at the minute are getting more and more popular is that something that is there like one of those ones that you sort of prefer to work in or try and get as much experience in that as possible i would think it's interesting when people people um want somebody who's got experience in a particular industry because i i tend to be of the opinion that um a well-rounded individual shouldn't necessarily need that now mm-hmm. i mean having said that most of my experience of late most of my work in the last couple of years has been in e-commerce in one way, shape or form. Yeah. That's been more by design than it has been, uh, sorry, more by demand than it has been by design. You know, it's just, that's what's happened. You know, these, these businesses are the ones that I've ended up working with, but it does give you, it does give you a, a, a tool set. I guess you can fall back on a lot of e-commerce sites have this exact same problems. Um, but I do always find it funny that people go looking for an agency or a freelancer who's got experience in their industry or in their market. Whereas actually, most website setups are very, very similar. The, the SERPs in a lot of industries are very, very similar. The principles of SEO are very, very similar, if not the same. Um, so there's, it, yeah, it, most, most of my work's e-commerce at the minute, but I don't particularly say I hone in on this area or I, you know, enjoy this area. I think variety is great. I think, I think the, the, the benefit of people who have worked in agencies and not just myself, but other people as well, or work in agencies is you learn things from, you learn things from working in one industry, you can apply to another industry. And if all, if all, if only your, ex, if all your experience is in one industry, then you never learn outside of that. You never think outside of that. And that's where really the, the opportunity lies. You just end up doing the same thing or the same thing as everybody else is doing. Um, yeah. So yeah, sort of a, there's a fine line between sort of specializing and then pigeonholing yourself in a certain industry as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, but in terms of when you're sort of onboarding clients and stuff, um, I know obviously as you sort of get more experience and you've sort of built up a strong reputation for yourself now um, in the sort of freelancing sort of circle, but how do you sort of work out pricing? Is it due to your experience? Does you increase your sort of services prices as you gain more experience or as you work with sort of larger clients or is it just sort of dependent on the company and the budget? I think, I think, um, I think when you first start out, uh, what most people will do is divide the salary they want by how many working days are in a, um, in a year and then start to work from day rates from there mm-hmm. really um which is quite a logical thing to do um mm-hmm. over time you, you know over time you have to evolve that approach i think a little bit um you've got to allow for more downtime sometimes so that means you, you your rates have got to go up you've um um you know, obviously obviously everything the cost of everything's going up so you've, you've kind of got to try and increase your rates mm-hmm. in line with things like inflation and stuff like that um or just when you see the opportunity to, because it's not always the case that you can just, you know, you might be able to speak to a client and say, I'm going to, I'm going to have to put my prices up my rates up. Most of the time you're having to do that between projects. So you'll finish one project at one rate and then you'll start a new project. You'll you'll have to pitch the new projects at a new rate because it's just the easiest way to change your pricing because that new person's never seen the old pricing. Therefore you don't (laughs) end up in that difficult discussion. It's just the way it is. Yeah. Um, and I think also, I think you've got to be a bit a bit cute with it, and you've got to understand when you um, when you're busy, you should kind of increase your pricing if someone's coming, taking, you know, try, trying to take up some of your time. Definitely, it's, it's supply and demand, isn't it? Um, there's, there's a temptation there not to, and just to try and keep taking on, you know, more and more work at the same pricing. Mm-hmm. But I think you've got to be a bit yeah. cute with it. Um, and then, and then most of it's a lot of it depends it depends on whether it's kind of retained work or whether it's project work. Project work tends to start with some sort of hour or day rate, but then be pitched as a single price. Mm-hmm. And then it's kind of my problem how long it takes me to get it done. <laughs> I get it done in the time. If I don't, there's kind of an allowance there as long as the 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 project doesn't become something that you didn't think it was to to say, well, I've just got to get it done now. And if that means I kind of technically earn less per hour when you break yeah. it down, that's kind mm-hmm. of my problem for, for mispitching it in the first place. And when you go down that approach, you have to build as the freelancer, you have to learn to build a little bit of fat in and go, well, I think it's going to take this much time. Let's build in 10, 20% for 
you know, for the, for the fact that there's going to be some unknowns within this. That I was going to say, seen. do you give yourself a certain amount of wiggle room each time, or does it just depend on the clan? I think you have to give give yourself a certain amount of wiggle room. I, th I think there's always going to be something you can't foresee. Um, you know, back back to one of your original points around budget. It's, it, it, it's always difficult when someone comes with a budget. Mm -hmm. as to, oh, depend, again, if it was massive, then fine. You can you can, you can always work within it. But most people, when they come with a budget, it's not massive. That's not that's typically yeah. not the scenario. They come in because they've got a specific number in mind, and then that that's where it starts to become a bit tricky because you're having to work out how can can I deliver value for this amount of money, um, and if so, what's the best way of of, of, uh, of delivering that value? And that's that's where you've, you've you've got to really understand the craft, and you've got to take some time to understand the current situation and where they're trying to get to. And if those expectations are wildly out back to the point about what clients should you take on you've got to walk away from something someone comes with a with a small budget and says i've got you know this is where i am now i'd like to be position one for these 300 keywords within the next two weeks and this is <laughs> and you've kind of yeah. got to say i'm sorry i can't do i can't do anything with that um because otherwise you just get yourself in, in problems yeah, yeah, and and uh, how do you go about uh, attracting new clients? What like approach would you take? Would it be through word of mouth, through social media? Is it a mixture of multiple things? Yeah, it's it's a mixture. It's um, it's it's uh, it's an ongoing challenge in many ways. It's um, I would say so. You've got to try and be consistent with what you're putting out on social media. Mm -hmm. But when I say consistent, consistent in the type of stuff, but also consistent in the frequency of said stuff you know um and that's be a problem when you get busy because all of a sudden you're busy and you and you're doing you're doing all your work and you like kind of has to go into the background um i was fortunate you know in the in the 15 years i was in the agency world is i built up a good network of contacts mm -hmm. um didn't piss off too many people over those years so most most of them are, are still in touch and and friendly with me so once they they know you're out there doing certain things then they're happy to refer you on to, onto businesses. And then I do do work, kind of subcontract work, contracting work for other kind of bigger consultancies, <laughs> bigger agencies and things like that, and, and act as a, a freelance department for, for them, whether that's overspill work or just work or expertise they don't have themselves in-house. So I work with a few development agencies, you know, where they're building websites. They want an SEO consultant in to make sure that they're built in the right way, they don't break anything, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you, you kind of need these multiple streams of work coming in in my opinion um well that's certainly how i've built it you've got these multiple streams of work coming in so if one drops off another one might pick up and then you're kind of balancing it uh balancing it to make up what you need yeah. i i uh <clears throat> i imagine I, I the concept of or the idea of ai right now is such a broad subject that if mm. i just say what are your opinions on ai <laughs> <laughs> um do you use any ai tools how do you incorporate that in your day-to-day -day work and i guess as a freelancer as well how do you justify maybe i guess competing against have you have you looked at it maybe as a threat or have you been able to use it as a tool like a, I don't think it's a threat for um, I don't think it's a threat for people who are um, applying experience and learning and, and, and you know and all these sorts of things to to the recommendations that they're putting out there because that's what AI is not doing it's providing a singular output of something whatever that mm -hmm. is an, an answer to a question a recommendation yeah. it's a singular it's not based on it's not based on experience. There's no experience there. It's not based on results because it doesn't have any results to to kind of feed itself at the minute. Maybe that comes in the future, but at the minute that that those results aren't there. So it's it's not based on that. Um, so I don't think it's a threat in that respect. Um, it's certainly an efficiency tool if it can be used properly. Yeah. Um, but it's got to be used cautiously, and, and I think that's as as you know the world of uh, copywriting will you know. Uh, will point out that an AI will an AI tool might spit out five hundred words of content, but is it gonna be any good? Is it gonna be mm. creative? Is it gonna be appealing to somebody to read it or is it gonna be five hundred words? Mm. Five hundred well, five hundred reasonably well structured words on a page. I won't say random because it won't be random, but you, you know yeah. what I mean. It's not yeah. it's yeah. not a writer, it's no there's no creative spin on it. It's just here's five hundred words based on something that you've inputted me. Um, and then, and what, and what you find when you do work with them, because I have worked with AI for copy generation and things like that, is that um, 
it still needs a strong editorial hand to kind of get it to where you want it to be. Otherwise, it's very clear that it is AI content. You know, if you if you built a built a website purely based on AI content, every page would be very similar, even if it was on a different topic. You see very similar trends with how it how it writes things, and you can't easily train that out of it. Even though you can train, kind of train these tools, you can't very easily do it. Um, and it would become very clear that it was it was written by AI um, yeah. to, to, to the human eye, you know, and, and, and then, so when you consider that, that a lot of businesses have got a, a brand to protect, have got a, uh, customers that they want to be perceived in a certain, we want to perceive them in a certain way, it's quite dangerous if you were to go fully down an AI route with copy generation, things like mm-hmm. that, because all of a sudden your website mm-hmm. doesn't look as professional as you wanted it to look. Your customers are reading it going, What's this? What's this rubbish? Yeah. Made, you know, and, and it starts yeah. to have a, a real negative impact there. I think that I think there's some some very um, good uses of it, and there's going to be more and more uses come out. Um, you know, smarter people than me, but will be using AI to kind of um, build on existing tools or build tools within AI. And um, and I've used it in a lot of ways to to validate kind of certain technical changes where maybe you know I don't know. I'm not an expert in JavaScript. A piece of JavaScript is something that's outside of my, you know, understanding, mm-hmm. but AI can help me understand what this particular script is doing. That's great, yeah. you know, because it helps me understand what's going on and it gives me a bit of insight and knowledge. I wouldn't then take those recommendations verbatim and do something with them. Yeah. Because, again, you know, it's on me really to, to you know, I've got to validate that, haven't I? So there's lots of efficiency gains from, from AI, undoubtedly. Um, I don't think it's a threat to true... What, what you might call knowledge work, you know, which is built mm-hmm. on experience and, and, and expertise yet. Um, I think I was most, I think I was more so structuring it in the sense of like, how do you incorporate that into you? Like, I guess rates that you would charge someone or um, deciding on that aspect, you know? Um, I don't think you do yet. I mean, certainly I yeah. wouldn't, I'd see it as if I work out how to become more efficient at something that's to my benefit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. True. Okay. yeah, in simple yeah. terms, you know, I work hard to do something ten times faster. The client still gets their the benefit that they were expecting for whatever money mm-hmm. they've agreed to get. If I can mm-hmm. do it ten times faster, then that's on that's me. Nice. I, I get the yeah. benefit. Yeah, definitely. Um, no, there there yeah. will be a there will be a kind of. I think there's probably a um, a way to run with that type of of um, that that type of thinking where that thinking falls down if someone takes my approach and then comes in and offers it 10 times cheaper and does try and mm. kind of pass the benefit on on to the cost we're a little mm. bit of a way o- away from that i think just yet I think for now it's to the benefit of the, the person using it and so, i know you mentioned it comes down to sort of years experience and stuff just from like a recruitment point of view um i've told it to quite a few seos maybe sort of more junior well a lot more junior than yourself maybe four or five years experience here now looking or considering to get into sort of freelancing or consultancy, would you have any sort of pieces of advice for them um, to do that? Or would you recommend anything that you've done? Um, I think four or five years is a, is a um, it's probably maybe a little bit of a dangerous point to, to be going freelance. I would, I would suggest mm-hmm. it's, it's interesting thinking about when, you know, if you're going to do it, if you're adamant, you're going to do it, when should you do it? There's not a black and white so obviously it's it's yeah. it's kind of different for everybody everyone's circumstances are different i think there's there's some kind of ways you could look at it and and say well maybe give it a go before you've got major financial commitments you know children uh, <laughs> things like that that, that are going to cost yeah. you a lot of money something i didn't do but maybe that's probably <laughs> a wise thing to do is do it before those things come in because actually you're only really putting at risk yourself and your income and you can probably go and get a job tomorrow if it doesn't go you know, if it doesn't go right. Um, mm-hmm. But then there's, you, you, you've got to overlay on that. Do you have the experience yet to do a good enough job? Do you have the contacts yet? Do you have the network yet? Do you have all the things that you need? Um, do you have kind of the ability to sell? You know, yeah. four or five years, if you've, just been, if you've just been in a business doing some SEO, do you have the ability to get yourself out there and convince someone else to buy off you? Um, it's all these other things that, that you develop over time. Um, I think four or five years is probably a bit soon. 
Um, unless, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's always caveats to these things. You know, if someone gives you the opportunity and says, why don't you go freelance and I'll pay you for three days a week, you come and, you know, mm-hmm. you do that for me yeah. and while you're building it up, then you've got a bit of a safety net there, haven't you? And you've got, you kind of, maybe exactly. maybe it does become the right right thing to do, but that's all kind of circumstantial. And in terms of, I know you mentioned just sort of the market and stuff, like how do you sell yourself? Is the sort of freelance market, is it competitive at the minute? Like, would you find yourself pitching against a couple of other freelancers for one piece of work or how does it not typically i mean um it does happen it does happen i, I tend not to it, it's not it's, i tend not to pitch in that in that same way it's not like if you were an agency and you go into pitch you know they might do the odd proposal might cost things up my, my approach tends to be if someone approaches me about something as and um, like i said before send them a lot of questions get the answers back say well this is what i think this is how i think of project would look this is the type of thing it is this is a rough ballpark cost Mm -hmm. if you want me to i can put proposal together for you that tends to see off the people who don't have the money being being completely honest or expected it to be a lot a lot cheaper um if they come back and say yeah then that's fine i'm happy to put the time into putting a proposal together and saying well this is a bit more detail about how it'd be structured over what length of time you know all, all the other things that they expect to see in it um sometimes that's a competitive process or so they're speaking to somebody else at the same time which is which is fine um a lot of the time it's not you know a lot of the time it's they've come across you as an individual whether it's your website yeah. whether it's social media whatever it is um they've been rec- you've been recommended to them which happens quite a lot yeah. um and so they they, they tend to or or well, if they reach that stage, a lot of the time it's it's just you and you're just getting things right and whether it works for them and maybe it doesn't, maybe it's not the time, right time for their business, whatever, and, and, and they can they can say so. Um uh but yeah, I don't I don't t- typically find myself kind of competitively pitching. Um or I try not to, to be completely yeah. honest, because I think no, it, it was more just out of it's out kind of, of a it's kind of a uh, there's always someone who'll do it cheaper. Always yeah, someone will do it yeah. cheaper. So it's like, un- unless you feel, unless I get a feel for them that there's definitely a connection there. You know, I've said something that they've latched onto. I've picked up on, on an issue that somebody else hasn't. They're saying to me, well, that sounds really interesting. You know, yet all these positive sounds from them. In that situation, maybe you will go down that route because you're like, right, I think I've got this. I just need to get the proposal right, you know? Yeah. Um, but if it feels like, you know, I'm speaking to two or three other people, then... Mm, yeah, I go off it a little bit because I just feel like um, they'll find someone who'll do it cheaper. Yeah, I'm not willing, yeah. I'm not willing to go into that that discussion. Yeah. And just taking like a step back, would you like to give us an explanation behind that lovely sweatshirt you're wearing? This one, <laughs> oh, okay. yeah, that one there. Yeah. I thought I thought it was a super hard one for a second. No, <laughs> <laughs> I've not got one. You'll have to send me one. Yeah, uh, no, so... <laughs> you, get, you get one after after the, the, the webinar. So you do. Yeah. It's, it's so good. so Bon Cru Wines is um is my wine business. So a couple of years ago, um, it was actually the, the, the I won't go into the long story. The short story is I decided that. Um, I should probably have, I'd like to try and run a business where I applied my skills to my business mm-hmm. as opposed to, you know, freelancing contracting and, and growing other people's business. Um, and we, and then I, I happened across a wine e-commerce business that was for sale. Um, and then a very good friend of mine is in the, um, the, the pub trade. He's got six pubs. Um, and we got talking and we ended up deciding we'd do something together. He knew, he knew kind of the trade. Mm-hmm. I knew about websites in his words. Um, <laughs> and so it, it kind of came together um, and we ended up buying a wine business. So for the last couple of years, um, we've been running, yeah, it's just coming up for two years now, it's 2021. We've been running a wine business as kind of a, a, a side project, which is both e-commerce and selling through pubs, his pubs and other pubs. Um, and yeah, it's been, it's been an interesting journey. It's certainly, I, I, I don't drink a lot of wine, by the way. I don't know a lot yeah. about wine. It was never about yeah. me being some sort of connoisseur. It was about me believing that, um, if you get in front of the right people, people buy it. You know, a lot of the wines that we stock, you can buy elsewhere. 
So then it just becomes mm. about service pricing and being one of the first that they come across, yeah. you know, and, and that's where I come into it and kind of grow, trying to grow the website traffic and things like that is if they find us first, we have a good price, good service, then we've got a good chance of getting the, getting the sales. So it's been, um, it's been an interesting couple of years. Yeah. It's, um, I've learned a lot about e-commerce that I didn't know. And it's funny really when you say that, because obviously I've worked with yeah. hundreds of e-commerce businesses over the 15, 20 years I've been doing this. Um, but there's so much more goes into it than just generating a sale on the website. I was, Obviously, you've got, got, you got to be looking at holistically now rather than just the, the ranking. But part you know what, you, what, what you realize, what you realize is why so many small e-commerce businesses have things like SEO so far down their priority list, because <laughs> you just can't get round to it. You know, if you went, mm-hmm. you went and looked over, um, the wine website, it's affordablewine.co.uk by the way. Um, you'd find lots of errors with it because mm-hmm. I cannot get the time in the day to get around to fixing them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm busy with, busy, busy with consulting, busy with actually trying to run the wine business and all the things that come with running a business. Um, mm-hmm. That actually, it, you, you, you understand when you've done it yourself that it is quite a long way down the priority list and why, as much as it might be frustrating if you're trying to work with an SME to get work done, why, they, why it just never happens because mm-hmm. they've got, 20 other things on the to-do list um, before it. Definitely. Well, I think that's, that's lost this round up, unless anybody has any sort of last questions. I've got a quick, very quick short one. Um, <laughs> 10 seconds. Um, so um, I just wanted to end off with um, uh, what are your three sort of aspects that you think would make a standout SEO, especially I think in a freelance or uh aspect it can be quite competitive um so okay. i think what are three can i just yeah. segue for one minute there was there was one thing that i think i think i think it's worth noting that I, I um i always have on my mind is that freelancing isn't for everybody mm-hmm. and that's not to put people off at all because it's, you get it right and it you know it's, it, it's, it's a great life um mm-hmm. and you get balance and all that sort of stuff but there's a lot that goes into it that I think that you maybe you don't understand. Obviously, you've got to Definitely, yeah. manage your finances, yeah. you've got to manage your taxes, you've got to chase invoices, mm. you've got to be sat. You know, I've, I've spent all day today sat in this room on my own. You know, that's not, that's not for everybody. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Some people need that interaction and need other things. And I think it does. Um, I'm not one for evangelizing anything to the nth degree a lot of people will you know on on link they're all over linkedin saying oh look at my lovely freelance life and Mm -hmm. here i am working on a beach and you know and all that sort of stuff which is great um yeah but there's absolutely nothing wrong with just wanting a job that you go to monday to friday and then having your weekends to yourself and having paid paid holidays you know and all these other things that are the the other end of the spectrum so i think it's always a a, a point worth making rather than just making everything out to be rosy but Mm. back to your point what are the three skills what are the three skills that an (laughs) sko needs um three skills I, i think i think communication is probably the top one and then that's not maybe not considered an seo skill but the ability to translate what you're saying needs to be done into the language that someone's going to understand and to do so in a persuasive way that they understand why they should go and do it is really, really valuable. Um, there's some very good, in, well, in all channels, there's, there's very, very good practitioners who, if they can't communicate that, it, it, it hinders them, it, it slows them down. Um, so communication is definite, definitely a key one. And I think specifically with SEO as well, um, because, you know, there are people out there who will um, say, oh, I don't understand it, or it's all, it's all voodoo to me and, you know, and all that mm-hmm. sort of stuff. And, just, and, and um, there's also people out there who will use that to their advantage. So the second one I'd say is um, a little bit honesty. And, and when I say mm-hmm. honesty, where, where, I say, where I say that is, if, if something's not going to have a massive impact, don't make out that it will. Maybe don't recommend it. You know, try and try and build recommendations and work into kind of impact and, and, and the work effort that's going in because it's only going to come back and bite you if you say something's going to have a great impact and then two months mm-hmm. down the line you've got a client going, where's my impact? Because it was, yeah. mm-hmm. oh, you've got to change these meta descriptions. You know, it's not going to have a great impact. You might do it, it's house, but it's housekeeping. It's not... Mm-hmm. It's not um, it's not going to have a great impact. So honestly, I think in there, and I think um, I think balance as well. 
I think balance, when I say balance, because I think that's a bit more across the board, balance between technical SEO, content-led SEO, you know, creative link building, whatever you might want, whatever you want to book mm. it into SEO. I think yeah. I think really good SEO has got balance across them and doesn't side with one or the other, doesn't say mm. links are everything, doesn't say technical is everything, doesn't say content's everything, has a balance, even if they specialize or, or lean towards one angle or the other. I think tie that in with the honesty. You know, the, the amount of um, good freelancers will turn down quite a lot of work because especially in the SME space, because you look at a lot of SMEs and they come and talk, they want to talk to you about, you know, doing something and you look at it and you go, it's not going to work. You, mm-hmm. You've got bigger problems than me doing a bit of work on your website. You know, your website's yeah. five yeah. pages. I'm not a magician. If, if your website's only five pages and you need to spend time building that out or you need to maybe go and maybe do some paid activity, maybe mm-hmm. do some referral activity or some networking or whatever before you start building you know, before you start looking at SEO because it's not going to solve your problems. And I think, so mm-hmm. I think um, having that balanced view and coupled with the, coupled with the honesty um, is what, is what really does make for a good SEO because that person who you said no to typically comes back in a few months time. Whereas mm-hmm. if you say yes to them and take the money off them now, you just burn it. You just burn in. You might get the money then, but then they'll never come back. They've, you've turned them off yeah. SEO. They think everything's broken sometimes it means the business fails if it's really small you know if it's a yeah. real small individual mm-hmm. one, one person band so it's um yeah i think i can't remember the three that i said now balance <laughs> honest, honesty and and uh communication. Communication. there you go yeah <laughs> perfect perfect um well yeah for everybody who's watching and who wants to get in touch maybe for your services or for your wine we'll put all your links to your website to your linkedin <laughs> to everything like that for you um and yeah, if there's anything else you want us to, to add on to it, we'll, we'll put that up. But honestly, Robert, Brilliant. thanks for coming on. I actually had a great conversation. I really appreciate it. All right. Cheers, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Cheers. See you later.